Hello, hello everyone. Um, my name's Martin Walker. Um, I am Chief Information Architect at Nordea. I'm a Brit, I married a Swede, so came over here and been here for seven years now. I'm going to talk to you today about getting control of your data landscape and the approach that we're taking, um, some of the lessons and some of the pitfalls that we've come across on the journey. So just a very quick one, I'm sure most of you know who we are, um, for good or bad. Um, we are actually the ninth biggest bank in Europe. We're a merger of over 300 banks originally, and we've got operations in the Nordics, Luxembourg, Singapore, UK, US. We've then got back, off, back office operations in Poland and India. So we're pretty multinational and all the complexities that come with that. Um, Say, so I am responsible. I kind of we've just set up a new organisation called the um, Group Data Office, um, and the CDO reports directly into the COO, who's also uh, also Deputy CEO. And I think kind of just listening to some things Nicola and others have been talking about today, um, I see a really exciting future for us because we've been working on the data governance journey for a number of years now. And one of the challenges is really getting the tone from the top. And I think now we really have that in place, and I think that's going to be really important as we move forward. And my overall responsibility is, um, one is kind of looking at how we simplify the architecture, and secondly is being able to explain to people where our data is in the organization and help them get value from the data that we have. So. I'm going to talk to you a bit about what are the business challenges that we've got. And again, a lot of these things you'll have heard before, but I thought let's start off with a business context, highlighting we're doing this for a reason rather than just for the fun of it. First one is digitalization. And you can look at that from a, I'm a corporate customer, I'm an Ericsson, and I want to ha interact with you Nordea via digital channels. Um, I want to see all of my view of the business with you. I want to be able to issue payments in real time. I want to see the outstanding payments. I want to see everything in a nice, friendly portal. I want my machines to talk to your machines. Through to we have our nice, friendly um, digital banking for our um, domestic customers. We've got customer insight and analytics. People are trying to work out whereabouts is the next value add. How can we add value to our customers using machine learning, AI, et cetera, et cetera. But how can we develop value from our data? And then on the, the more the, the back end side of things, we've got good old risk and regulation. We've got GDPR. Um, for us, BCBS 239 is big. Anacredit is big. So Anacredit means we have to report the tax agencies, individual bal account balances to kind of at a personal level. So we have to be able to get a really detailed view of information just to keep our banking license. This is not optional. This is not like being a Facebook or a Google where if you lose the odd posting here or there or you lose a friend here or there, it really makes a difference. For us, we need to have absolute certainty in our data and in our lineage. Therefore, we, we get a, a very different environment to some of these big Kind of big technology firms that you often hear about as being exemplars for how you can really use your data. And then the fourth area is simplification. So we're in the middle of replacing our core banking systems, our core payment systems, and we're transforming our whole data infrastructure. So we're trying to change heart, lungs, brain, all in one go while, the, the kind of, while trying to run a marathon. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, the thing that they've all got in common is they're all saying, what is our data, where is our data, and who's using our data? And we talk about for the corporate good. At the moment, everyone, or historically, everyone goes and asks these questions individually. So as part of GDPR, we went running around collecting a data asset register. As part of Anacredit, we had to go around and identify all, where all of our transactional information was. As part of FATCO, we had to go off and identify where all of our transactional information was for American customers. So we go on completely repeating the process of what's our data, where's our data, and who's using our data. So why is it complicated then? Well, what is our data? Kind of we, what's our terminology? How do we refer to data? You call it an apple, I call it a fruit. Are they related? 
kind of our, the regulator gives us reams and reams of descriptions of the data that they want us to report to them about. We have to interpret that. We go off and buy COT systems. Each of them comes with their own unique data model, and they all describe data in their own ways. And then guess what? It comes together, and we have to integrate it and report on it. We've got different languages all over the place before you then add in the nationality of the languages. So we need to have a common way of describing our data. Where is our data? As I said, we're over 300 banks that have merged. We've got thousands of IT systems. I think we, we identified 1,400 systems that have got customer data in them. We've got multiple copies and multiple versions and multiple formats. So we have a challenge. A business process runs monthly. However, somebody needs an update of that data mid-month. So what do they do? They take the official month-end version, they then adjust it and make modifications to it. And they then have their version of the same data. We book data in, uh, we, we book transactions in systems in ways that supports one user but may not support the full value chain. I, I heard a great, great example from another institution. It was an insurance in London. And Ayrton Senna was insured as a ship. So um, when Ayrton Senna died, they had to file a report for a distressed vessel. And so this is how business works. We have these big old IT systems, and we've got these business units who want to go out and do business with customers who do whatever business they can, and we adjust the use of the IT system to support the business we're trying to do. But from an IT point of view, we know nothing about that. From a data point of view, we end up putting data in fields where we wouldn't necessarily expect to find, field, find the data. And then who uses the data? Again, we've heard about data producers, data curators. We have data consumers. So there's different people involved in the data value chain. And they've all got different interests in their data. And we have to work out how do we satisfy the needs of these different people and really join the value chain up. And I think the, the value in managing our data landscape is how do we support the consumers in getting the producers to, to get the data right for them. I, I often talk about data quality is sort of in the eyes of the beholder i.e. if you're a consumer of data, you have a different view of quality to another data consumer. So we have to juggle that and work out what is fit for one may not be fit for purpose for another. So we really need data management capabilities yesterday. Don't get me wrong, we've gone out and bought every license under the sun. We've got all the technology that anyone could throw at you. It's about how do we really embed this at an enterprise level. We do it very well to support individual product lines or individual business areas, but now with the global digitized world and the regulatory environment we're under, we have to be able to bring our different parts of the business together and manage it at an enterprise level. So how does the industry manage it today? I'm going to try to really oversimplify it here, but try and give you a bit, bit of food for thought. So we, we start talking about how does your data landscape look? And people think, well, what does that look like? And, and I, as part of this, I did a Google to look up data landscape. And the types of things that I saw was logical data models, or I'd find logical application models, which it shows an, a system here, a system there, and a line joining them together, and spaghetti. And then often when I found data landscape, I'd find the big data stack environment and all of the different vendors out there. But what we do is we simplify things. So here is the, the logical application view, which is the London Underground map, as an example. But it's very simplified. If you look at the, the physical view, that's the London Underground overlaid onto London as to what it really looks like. That's what we've got a habit of doing in our industry, in, in architecture in general, is we try and simplify things for people to understand, but it, in itself it does a disservice because we then don't really actually understand the complexity of the change that we need to, to push through. So this gives you a nice view of the track, but we haven't even talked about the trains yet. And the trains is the data. This is the pipe work. This is the equivalent of our interfaces between IT systems. What happens with the trains? 
So from an operations viewpoint, we have plans. We have a train timetable. We may have a work roster. We may have an uh, inventory of all of the different um, trains that are going to be used on the network. Can I ask you a question? Do you often find trains are on time? I know in Sweden we're quite good, actually. But how often have you seen a delay with a train? You have the same thing with your data packages. What happens when a data package is delayed going from A to B? In the train metaphor, we have a control center. And it says the delayed 1808 train from Stockholm to Uppsala um, is going to be cancelled because the 1818 train to Stockholm Uppsala is still going on time. Therefore, everyone unload and get onto the new train. But we don't seem to do that with our data. We send a package, a data package, and it gets delayed for some reason. And then we send another one. Do we mark one as delayed and one as the, the non-delayed version? Do we know at an enterprise level how to ensure that people are picking up the right, right packages of data for the right use? No, we don't, because we typically have this point-to-point -point infrastructure. So we need to start thinking about data in the same way that we think about any other supply chain, and how do we manage that at an enterprise level. So that was really our inspiration for thinking, how, do we, how should we get control of our data landscape? Let's take some lessons from the, um, from the food industry, from the transport industry, and think, how can we apply that to how we manage our data? So we came up with a number of design principles. We said we need to be regulatory compliant. Whatever approach we take, it has to be non-intrusive. We can't be going around to all of the different source systems and saying, you need to go and completely re-engineer your systems. You've got to go and change your language that you use. Sorry, this SAP language, it doesn't really work for us anymore. You need to change that. And at the same time, we need to really unlock the data power. And that's a combination of getting insight from data and also using some of the new tools that, that, that are available to us. And our overall principles were data ownership. It starts with the ownership. We need to make sure we can find people, the, the right people who are accountable, and to, to get them to understand the ownership. It's about getting in place consistent terminology. That doesn't mean going down into detailed dictionaries and trying to write um, every single term and say, thou shalt obey this, th this individual dictionary term. It's about getting data concepts that we can relate to. We want to make disparate data transparent. So how do we take those thousands of systems and get a view of it? One, one theory, one school of thought that's been going around the industry for a while, just chuck it all into Hadoop. It'll be fine. Put it all in there. And it's another of the, sorry vendors out there, it's a, it's a myth. It's just going to kill you. It costs too much. You can't do it. So we have to think, how do we get a disparate view of our data and, 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 get, and, and understand what it is? We need to understand our data flow in the bank. For BCBS 239, uh, risk data aggregation principles, we need to be able to demonstrate to the regulator that we have a risk metric in this report and we understand the lineage. So I understand that it has come from this process that in, in turn has a calculation that comes from all of these other processes. We need to be able to build up, build up that view for us. We need to keep confidential data confidential. And we should be looking to use machine learning in order to help us understand the data landscape. If we have to go out and ask everyone to tell us about their data, then we're going to be here for a very long time. We just don't have the time to sit there and fill in another set of spreadsheets, another set of questionnaires. And the foundation is data architecture, not technical architecture, i.e. we're looking at where the trains are on the tracks. We're not, we need to know the tracks, but it's where the trains are that's the really the important piece. So we're really, kind of our strategy is based on sort of um, five main, main areas. And the first one is getting in place an information catalog, which starts off with a glossary. No revenue news here. I think this is what most organizations are trying. The second area is we need to get a business process view of the world. And as part of this, we need to mark up our business processes with our business terms that we use in our glossary. So if in our glossary we talk about corporate loans and household loans, we need to make sure that our business process documentation refers to process loans and household loans. 
we need to make sure that it refers to the application that's in the application register, not what they happen to call it as, a, as a, um, an alias. But the things I really want to focus on where we think it's very different to the approach that's been taken so far is something we call operational lineage. And operational lineage for us is a, a, giving us an empirical view of what our data landscape actually looks like. And what we're doing is we're going out and putting data sensors round on our different applications, so typically where they transmit data. And then those data sensors, you could look at being as like an internet of things, transmit the equivalent of a barcode of information back to the center whenever a package of data leaves or arrives at a system. And the, I, and I, the reason I call it a barcode is we're not sending all of the data back, because again, that's not feasible. What we're doing is sending back key pieces of metadata that we think is important to understand from a data landscape at a macro level. So in our case, our starting point is understanding the legal entity of the data, the product that the data is referring to, and the data life cycle, i.e. is it transactions, is it finance, is it provisions, that's all. We're not saying take all of the da data, dump it in Hadoop and try and find those needles. We're saying, what are those really small pieces of information that we need to know about in order to effectively manage our landscape? And what does effective mean? Well, the primary use case was, was initially radar, BCBS 239, and the second one is, um, is GDPR. So one of the other pieces of information we will be transmitting back is where the personal data is in the file that is being transmitted. So that's all we'll be transmitting. As we go in, we can get deeper and deeper, we, so we can actually identify if individual names, for example, are being transmitted and send those back to help us with our compliance and understanding, again, what data is where in our landscape. What does that give us? Well, these are just two example screenshots of how we can then visualize our data landscape. The first one here shows connection flow. So the, the top half shows where arrows move in one direction, so it's sort of data coming into a system, and the bottom shows where data leaves the system. Okay, sounds fairly normal so far. But what we then do is we apply machine learning based on, on thematics to identify what a normal data pattern looks like versus what an abnormal data pattern looks like. So as an example here where we have a little gray box, this is saying on this particular day, every other day, this system for this particular legal entity transmitted data, but today it hasn't. Ah, what do we do? We then raise a workflow that goes to the data owner for that system and the data consumers to say, are you aware that this system has experienced problems? Please confirm that you understand this for your risk data aggregation purposes. So what we can do is we can start using, say, machine learning to actually understand what normal looks like. And as we discover anomalies, we can then trigger workflow to actually investigate what's gone on. The second one gives us a thematic picture of what our data world looks like. And again, light blue indicates data sent, dark blue indicates data received. And the size of the bu bubble indicates the size of the data package. So you can say at the beginning of the day, we've got a lot of batch type activity, few number of events, but high volume per event. You go th through the day and you can see lots of small messages, so probably highly trading activity. And then for lunch, it goes quiet. And then it gets busy in the afternoon, and then you have got more batch events later on in the day. So you can start visualizing what your data landscape actually looks like. This is just two examples of many that we're then building in to, to the solution. So how do we then go about implementing it? I think there's some key lessons here as well. Number one is you need a top-down approach starting with both management and getting the buy-in, but also starting thinking about, let's not try and boil the ocean. We tried doing something called technical lineage, which, was, um, which is something that was sold, kind of a concept that's probably seen at a conference or sold by a vendor, which was, let's go and reverse engineer all of our DDL from our data warehouses and put them into our governance tool. That's going to help us. And you know what it told us? 
It told us how bloody complicated all the logic is in our warehouses. Um, and it doesn't tell you about what's in the data. It tells you about what the piping is. But it doesn't tell you that there's actually a missing, or that you've got a corporate name in a household name field. So you need to start top down. Focus on one to two use cases. So we're focusing very much as say, on, on radar and GDPR. Um, start with the most critical data. So as I say, we're focusing on three, and the fourth one we're looking at at the moment is also cu is customer stroke counterparty in order to, or individual for GDPR purposes. Start with the most critical data hubs, so, and then work forwards and backwards from it. So again, we can't roll out all these sensors everywhere overnight, so we need to start somewhere. So it's about where is, kind of, for us, the, again, the starting, it's quite interesting because you've got GDPR, where you're focusing more around the CRM type world, and then from a, um, a, a regulatory perspective, you're focusing more around the financial and the risk warehouses. So that's where we'll start putting the sensors first. Um, use policy to drive the implementation. One, one of the, the ways that we've seen other banks do this kind of internationally is to put sensors out on the network and to try and sniff the data. And again, you can get a view of the data, but the problem with that is it becomes an IT problem. And so what we're doing here is to say, in order for you, Mr. Application Owner, to be radar compliant, you need to adhere to the bank's policy on lineage. To do that, you must do the following things. You must install the sensors on your network, and you must mark up in our data governance tool, our IGC tool, um, whereabouts these, this critical information is. And by the way, we're going to give you a whole heap of tools to help automate that task for you. So use policy to drive inf implementation and incentivize the data owners to drive adoption. When they can start seeing the value of understanding what their lineage is, and it can help them understand where the data quality problems are, because I'm a, or I'm a data owner for FX, and all of a sudden I can find over there, this person's got FX data. How do they get all of that? Well, you know what it is. It's like, have you, have you got the FX data? I need some. You go and speak to the nearest person who may have got it. And that's the reason we get this proliferation or expansion, uncontrolled expansion, of data interfaces everywhere. So it's about sh using the, the process and the tool to really add value to, to data owners. And then after, don't get distracted by the detail. The problem we have here is we've got such a, such a big problem on our plate. And anyone who works for a large corporate will know this as well. We have such a big data problem on our plate. You cannot solve everyone's problem at once. When we start talking to data warehouse owners, they're saying, can this do a quality check on an individual field for me? I said, yes, in the future, but not today. We're focusing on the big ticket. If I'm missing a legal entity from my report, I think that's fairly important. That can focus on the big ticket issues. And yes, there could be one bad transformation that's taking place within the data warehouse. But I'm sorry, I can't help you with that problem. You need to get control of your data warehouse. So don't get distracted by the detail. So that was really what I thought I'd have to say to you today. I say, trying to be a bit more provocative in the thinking. 